The Honorable Chief Justice, um, the DPP, the Honorable Members of the Judiciary, our invited guests, our invited speakers, um, Honorable Minister for Women, Children, and Poverty Alleviation, um, our after dinner speaker from last night, and of course our special rapporteur uh, who is here with us, the special rapporteur on environmental rights, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it gives me much pleasure to add a few comments uh, toward the end of this conference. As you know, this is the 20th AG's conference, and uh, we are quite uh, proud to have had the 20th anniversary uh, of the AG's conference. And of course, um, we've had a record number of people who participated in this year's uh, conference. I was, um, somebody said to me uh, about three, four weeks before the conference, they said, we've seen the topics you've got. You know, it doesn't look very lawyerish. The topics you've got looks very esoteric. Uh, they're not directly related to the rules of the court of law. They're not about a particular section. Um, and you're not talking about, for example, the high court rules. The AGES conference, ladies and gentlemen, is all about discussing areas of the law, discussing topics that may not necessarily be directly related to a particular section of the law. The whole purpose of the AGES conference, as you've seen in particular over the past four or five years, is to bring about a thought process, is to get people to start thinking about new areas of the law, is to start getting people to think about perhaps laws that do exist, but they're not aware of it at all. And I'll give you a number of examples of that. The idea also is, ladies and gentlemen, we do invite the judges too to attend, and it's good to see many judges are here, uh, including, of course, the President of the Court of Appeal, and members of the Court of Appeal, members of the High Court, and also um, the magistracy. Is for them to also understand what are the lawmakers doing? What's the intention behind some of the laws? We are a post-colonial society. We are a very young democracy. We only gained our independence in 1970. We have relics of the British legal system still within our laws. We have laws that are about 100 years old at the moment, even some of them a bit longer than that. We need to change those laws. We need to make them appropriate for a post-independent society. A society, of course, that's had its own history post-independence. So if we are bringing about laws, if we are formulating laws, the judiciary also have to understand what's the intention behind these laws? What's the rationale behind it? What is the ep epistemological basis of many of this thinking? Because the judges, we believe, have an equal role to play. They're not simply there to take one particular interpretation. Indeed, if they are taking an interpretive approach, a purposive approach to interpreting the law, they need to go behind the law and look at what parliament has done. What are the debates in parliament? Or are they simply going to take a literal interpretation of the law? So the whole idea of this conference, ladies and gentlemen, is for judges and lawyers to also become a lot more cognizant about the changes, not just in Fiji, but also what's taking place overseas. And I'd like to thank all our overseas uh, guests, the speakers, because I'm sure many of you would agree they brought, brought about a particular way of thinking, they brought about their own experiences that many of us have not actually been exposed to. And I'd like to thank them for that. So please put your hands together for all our overseas <laughs> guests in particular. We have also, as you know, uh, government um, gave an undertaking a few years ago that every year we will call a special rapporteur to Fiji in the different areas and for them to critically assess and understand what is happening in Fiji in various aspects. And of course, this year is to do with environmental rights. We've had the special rapporteur on uh, racism, xenophobia, rapporteur on education, on access to water and various other uh, areas. And of course, we'll be having more uh, in the years to come. And ladies and gentlemen, as, as per tradition, I tend to generally summarize uh, the subjects that have been discussed, and I like to start off with competition, because that's the one you've just finished off from, and probably the least I have to say about, um, in the sense that uh, the, the reality is that many uh, aspects of business in Fiji have gone under the radar. The, the, the general uh, modus operandi of the commission used to be, for a number of years, simply looking at pricing in monopolistic position, in situations. So if, for example, the cement factory wanted to raise the price, or if um, AFL wanted to raise the price, if uh, some other entity that had a, a sole supply of cement or steel, they would make submissions to the commission, the commission would look at the books, and essentially then 
come to a pricing agreement. And that's the price that they would sell that particular product or service for, whether it's electricity or water. Of course, the Commission's role is much wider, and many people actually don't understand this, as was highlighted by our guests from Australia and New Zealand. We have never thought about carteling as an issue. Many of you probably don't know, as, ha as highlighted in the budget, that today, 60 to 70 percent of all the products in the supermarkets are actually imported only by five or six companies. Only five or six companies sell nearly 70 percent of all the products that you buy in supermarkets. So despite, for example, um, VAT reductions, despite duty reductions, or zero rating of duty, they don't actually get affected. They still control the pricing. So what are we doing about it? Indeed, should we do something about it? Should there be laws made about it? Do the judges know about it? For example, if we do bring these new amendments and they, somebody gets actually penalized under this, do they know the historical basis as to why these laws have been brought about? So it's very important for us to understand what's actually uh, taking place uh, in Fiji. And I'd like to, of course, thank the FCCC for their uh, ongoing work. I think uh, Joel Abraham has brought a breath of fresh air uh, to the Commission, but obviously there's a lot more work to be done uh, in, in that respect. Penalty provisions, for example, um, I understand we've been told that our penalty provisions for companies are too low. A million dollars, many people if you say a million dollars, they say, oh wow, that's a lot of money. But frankly, it's not a lot of money if you look in the overall economic sense. So there is, of course, a need to revamp those laws, and of course we will be revamping those laws, making it a lot more easier to read, a lot more easily accessible, uh, to everybody, but will require input uh, from the lawyers, will require input from the people in the industry. And this is one of the reasons why we're actually discussing this particular, or brought this particular topic. You as legal practitioners, of course, will be representing clients who may be affected by the laws, the existing laws, and indeed the new laws. So it's important for you to be able to understand that. And the point that I like to make a general point, as I said to one of the lawyers last night, in Fiji, the legal profession is very much centered around Many lawyers, as you know, there are a lot more lawyers now within the system. It would appear most of them want to set up their own practices. And most lawyers actually have what we call single practitioner practices, or maybe two. And they're all competing for the same thing. They all have what we call a general practice. Very little specialization in Fiji. Everybody's doing criminal, everybody's doing civil. Some may be doing a bit more conveyancing, some may be doing less. But there is definitely a need to specialize. There is definitely a need to be aware of what are the changes that are taking place in society, not just from a legal perspective, but also commercially, and how you can fit yourself into that new economic framework that we have. And so the era of specialization is very, very critical, and I'll get back onto uh, some of that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, you know, many, uh, we also like to see you, as was highlighted by His Excellency the President, uh, the legal profession represents a particular uh, group of professionals that have a huge influence in what people think and how people think. So the fact that, you know, FCCC puts up the price of fuel or puts down the price of fuel, mainly it's when they put up the price of fuel, it's beyond their control, but people talk about governments put up the price of fuel. It's got nothing to do with government. It's got to do with what Donald Trump perhaps is saying about the Middle East, and what's happening in Saudi Arabia, whether it's a cold winter in Northern Europe and there's huge demand for fuel, and therefore because of the demand, the price of fuel goes up, and we're simply price takers. We have absolutely zero influence on the pricing of fuel. So these are some of the things that you also need to have an understanding because you may also be representing clients. You may also be looking at things like margins. And I think if you specialize, you'll be able to represent your clients, even before the FCCC, when they're making submissions to them. In that respect, we're also looking at uh, specific areas like Landlord and Tenants Act, uh, revamping that. As you know, that there's currently a freeze on residential properties. And as was highlighted by one of the senior practitioners, that you know it's leading to a skewing in the market. So people know the right rental may be you know, X, Y, Z in five years' time, so they'll say to you that I'll lease my, my flat to you for $2,000 a month, but I'll discount it to $800. So they have not actually changing the price of the rent, but they know that every year they can increase it, every two years they can increase it. So are they kind to obfuscate the, the system? So these are some of the issues that we need to uh, uh, think about 
uh, from those uh, processes. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Ancitral, of course, is uh, very, very important uh, to us. We now have the International Arbitration Act that just commenced on the 4th of December. Very new law, only four days old. But it's been, it was gazetted, uh, I think, many, many months back. So hopefully we looked at the gazetted law. It has already come into effect. So how will that impact upon your profession? As you know, arbitration is not something that's deemed to be very sexy in the legal profession in Fiji. Litigation is sexy. Everybody wants to go to court and argue the cases. But the reality is that the way that the commerce, industry, the commerce uh, operates, the reality is that Fiji is now becoming a hub in the true sense of the Pacific. We have multi-donor uh, agencies. I'll give you a very uh, real example. We are doing a rehabilitation of the uh, Nandi River. Uh, it's going to be about a $400 million project. We are looking at European Investment Bank, ADB, JICA, the Japanese government, and of course the Fijian government. Now there'll be numerous suppliers to this particular project. So what's going to happen to arbitration should there be a dispute? The CEO of FRA is here. He knows all about disputes. So are you going to, if somebody comes knocking on your door, on your office door and says, can you give us some advice? Can you represent us? Do you know anything about arbitration? Do you know how Incitral works? So these are some of the critical areas that you need to be able to remodel yourselves and be able to understand. Uh, we, Fiji, of course, from an economic perspective, about 153 countries have actually ratified this law, and most of them are trading partners. So hitherto, we had not been part of this. So we now need to make ourselves to be part of this uh, particular uh, arbitration process. And by way of um, uh, an announcement, we'd like to say that uh, working with the judiciary, we will set up an arbitration center, uh, separate to the mediation center. And you'll see some changes in that in respect in the next few months. And Singapore, of course, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, is an arbitration hub. And they've been able to all of the legal profession, the judiciary, the industries and the commercial sector all came together to make Singapore a hub. There's a lot of work going around. Australia has just recently announced uh, $2 billion that they'll give out by way of soft loan to the Pacific Island countries. Now, some company may be given a contract to, bit sea, uh, to build seawalls in Tuvalu or Kiribati. There may be disputes. Have you thought about representing clients from those countries? Have you thought about how we can use Fiji as an arbitration hub? These are some of the things we want you to be able to consider, and this is what we are, in fact, uh, considering and what we can do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, uh, before I go on to the electronic smart contracts and electronic transactions, I wanted to show you a video. This is probably a take, hopefully help you relax a bit, a take on what somebody's uh, spin is on electronic transactions. Maybe you can play that video, please. Very short one. You've got to be quick. Watch it. Play it again. <laughs> Maybe one more time, those who missed it. <laughs> A few years ago, nobody took out money like that or through ATM machines. But now if you take away ATM machines, most of you won't survive. About a year ago, we introduced e-ticketing. Big kerfuffle about it. Now through e-ticketing, they're collecting about $120 million a year through e-ticketing itself. We know exactly which bus company makes how much money. We know exactly which bus company, which route makes how much money. We know the loading of passengers on each route. We are now able to say to those people over the age of 60, we will give you an e-ticketing card. We load $40 on it a month. We know exactly how many disabled people are actually going to travel on the cards. When we had a school bus fare being subsidized prior to e-ticketing, we used to give vouchers to schools and teachers. And those vouchers used to be printed and then given to teachers, and they would distribute to the school students. Then we discovered a scam. A group of teachers with some senior students started re photocopying it and selling for half price. They can no longer do that with e-ticketing. 
So the reality is that technology is here. The reality is that we need to be able to understand the technology. Of course, many of us don't necessarily understand blockchain. And blockchain and those kind of smart contracts may not be a reality in Fiji, but it will be a reality very, very soon. There are many transactions that are taking place. The Electronic Transactions Act 2008 was a mid in 2017. The principal equivalency is already there. Do we know what it means? Electronic filing of documents. All of that exists. How up to speed are we with that? Ladies and gentlemen, the Ministry of Communications, together with the Attorney General's Chambers, is also in the process of setting up CERT, which is the Computer Emergency Response uh, Team. We will also, working with uh, our expert, uh, Fernando, uh, working towards uh, the accession of the Budapest Convention. Of course, a huge impact in respect of that, and how we will get regarded as a place of good, uh, a good destination for commercial transactions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just wanted to very quickly highlight what uh, Saud Minam also mentioned, is that by having more of a, what we call a cashless society, uh, we will in fact be increasing liquidity. In the budget we managed in 2018, 2019, we've set aside funding to subsidize small shops to have point of sale machines, you know, those pause machines we call them. If you go now at the moment, if you go to um, uh, a shop and you want to use your uh, ATM card or your uh, uh, ATM card with them, they'll say minimum sale $10. I can walk, in, walk into a shop in New Zealand, buy a bottle of water with my ATM card. And I've said to people, I want people very soon in Fiji to be able to buy some Chinese lolly with the ATM card. And that's where we need to get to. But it has an enormous impact on the economy. Because when you have more electronic transactions you have, the more liquidity you have in the market. Essentially because the cash is not taken out of the system. It simply gets transferred from person A, B, C, D, E, F. So money stays within the system, and therefore anybody that wants to borrow money, the cost of that money will be less. So it leads to, of course, economic prosperity. Uh, you also need to understand, with the cause of electronic transactions, things like legal obligations. What are the legal obligations of your clients? How do you determine the legal obligations? We're getting into a space now, of course, many of us are very quick at uh, emailing, sending various representations. Can that be used against you? Your Facebook posts, what are the implications of that? So, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, would like people to be able to think about these processes. I mean, Ada Yarawa asked about, uh, you know, how can we go after people if we don't know their identity? Under the Financial Transactions Reporting Act, you have your, you know, KYCs or know your customer requirements, the minimum qualification requirements for knowing your customers. Of course, that will change. We are launching an app very soon where you'll be able to uh, register your, your baby's birth a name, actually, your name online. So you can go on your mobile phone app, you can give the details, once the hospital gives you the details of the birth, you then will get an ID number, you go to the uh, BDM office and simply pick up your birth certificate. And hopefully, with five, six months' time, you'll be able to pay for that online. And by the middle of June, July next year, sorry, you'll be able to get an e-birth certificate. So when you go to enroll your son or daughter into school, you simply tap your phone against the machine in the school, and then they have a copy of birth certificate. They'll completely change of how, how we do business, how we view transactions and legal duties and obligations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, um, the other area that we're quite keen, and I'm, just, I'm preempting this, there's still many people in Fiji who get ordinary workers who get ripped off. I'm sure many of you would have seen people working at construction sites. And on a Friday, they would be getting paid a brown envelope or getting paid cash. We want that to stop. One of the best ways of doing that is also paying them electronically on their phones. And we currently, we're talking to uh, some mobile phone companies and also the banks. Because if you make that compulsory, in particular where you have connectivity, then there's better accountability. Nobody will get ripped off. People at the moment don't have the FNPF paid, some of them. We need to have strict liability law regarding that. You may represent clients or clients of yours who may be not paying their employees FNPF. 
You may have clients who will now have to pay electronically through mobile phones. So do you know the rules around that? And that's some of the changes that we want to, of course, uh, bring about, uh, ladies and gentlemen. There are now monies being transferred through M-Pesa. What if Vodafone makes a major glitch and your client wants to claim their money from M-Pesa? Are you aware of the rules around electronic transactions? Are there enough rules around that? So these are some of the areas that we want you to think about. And of course, we are not saying that all the answers do exist. There may be gaps in the law that we need to address. But the reality is that technology has actually gone ahead of us. And we're playing a catch-up game. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the, um, you know, I um, looked at, uh, I talked about interpreting the law. And uh, there's one particular clip that uh, brought, was brought to my attention. I want to play that for you, just in case you're getting a bit sleepy. So please watch this. You have to watch this really quickly, too. Can you play that, the high? Sir, how high are you? No, officer, you're wrong. It's high. How are you? Can you play that again, please? Does you missed out. Sir, how high are you? No, officer, you're wrong. It's high. How are you? Something for the judges to think about, too. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the, um, uh, again, because of changing times and changing technology, we had a session on the cities of tomorrow. In Fiji today, the laws that we have, the setbacks that you have, the easement rules that you have are very, very archaic. The fact that our entire thought process of owning a house means one house, one building structure on a block of land, as was highlighted by the issue about uh, high density living. We do not conceptualize a home as being a flat in a block of apartments. We are one of the lowest rate of home ownerships. One of the lowest rate of home uh, insurance. Only 10% of the properties in Fiji are actually insured. So obviously government has a particular goal in respect of housing. But as I highlighted that we changed the laws a few years ago in respect of strata titling. So now you can get a 1990 year lease on a block of apartments built on Itauke land. You can now get a 99 year lease on an apartment built on what we call crown land or government land or state land. Now these have changed, but of course those of you who do conveyancing need to wrap your head around this. Those of you from the banking fraternity need to wrap your head around this. Because that's how the rest of the world is actually functioning. You know, in Singapore, as I highlighted in the, in the intervention that I made yesterday, is that you have on, on, a, on a floor, you have different price points. Many young people in this room don't actually own their own house. We like the young people to own their own house really quickly. You may start off with a one-bedroom house or one-bedroom apartment. Then you move on to a two-bedroom. You may then get a good price for your two-bedroom apartment and then you know, move on to your third-bedroom apartment or third-bedroom house on a block of land. But the catch of the matter is there must be an appreciation of the value of your property. Because otherwise you'll be stuck in that particular apartment that you just bought if, the, if there is a depreciation in the property. So the way that we view what we call low-cost housing, affordable housing, uh, needs to change. Building codes, of course, again. I saw a couple of lawyers here who are, who are here from municipal councils. Municipal councils need to change the attitude too. If we are, for example, tomorrow going to change the building code rules that you must have 10%, 15% efficiency requirements, are the lawyers aware of what is required? Are the municipal councils aware of what is required for us to be able to um, enforce that? So you, of course, will be representing clients. The one area, of course, that we are very keen on is the selling of electricity. If we are, for example, going to mandate and say every house must have X number of solar panels depending on the size of the roof, then do they simply generate electricity and supply to their own selves, or do we have a, a buyback system? So are you in a position to be able to represent maybe a group of clients in a new subdivision who can actually negotiate with EFL 
and say, look, we want to sell our electricity for X, X price. And then you sell it back to us at X price. These are a number of issues that you need to be uh, aware of, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We have also, um, uh, in, in that respect, uh, it was very interesting that they say that in Vanuatu, they had a six month period or grace period for plastic bags. We have given you two months of grace, uh, two years grace period. And still people are complaining about that. But the reality of the matter is that we need to adopt new ways. The reality of the matter, if you look at many of the publications, the media organizations, you see many drains are actually blocked because of plastic. We need to be able to change that. Are you in the space of reusing and recycling? Because you may be representing clients who may want to set up factories in that respect, or set up recycling plants. These are some of the new opportunities that does, uh, does exist. We have, as you know, uh, uh, as mentioned, we, we brought in the Singaporeans, and we hope to sign further agreements with them. Uh, the Dr. Liu, uh, who is the great architect of Singapore, is in fact going to be uh, looking at our laws in Fiji. Uh, and changing the, the development plans, in particular to the municipalities. We have a very old mindset, colonial mindset. One town, one big bus stand, one big market. Every Saturday we all catch the bus, go in the car, go to that one market. Even though you may be living in Tamavua, even though you may be living in Rewanga, or you're living in Tawakumbu, you have to go all the way down to town. We must change that. Reduce our carbon footprint, accessibility, we should have mini markets all over the place. You don't need one big bus stand. You can have decentralized bus stands, decentralized markets. It is very interesting when I talked to uh, Dr. Uh, Liu um, some months back on the phone, you know, I talked to him about the challenges and the opportunities we have because 50% of the population is below the age of 27. He said, yeah, but you must remember, in 30, 40 years time, they'll all become old. So can they catch the bus? Or do you want to set up markets so they can walk to the market? They can walk to the supermarket. They can walk to the pharmacy. They can walk to the doctor. So our planning needs to be way ahead of, what, of where we are today. But of course, there's a number of legal implications. We need to reduce our carbon footprint in that respect too. The four laning of the road between uh, Nasori and Suva will be completed by June, CEO. Completed by June. <laughs> He's put his thumbs up. Just. <laughs> We're also going to do undergrounding of electricity from uh, Nasinu to Nasori. But the fact of the matter is they'll, they'll give us an opportunity to have dedicated bus lanes. So from 6.30 a.m. in the morning or 6, 6 a.m. in the morning from Nasori all the way to Suva, the left lane will be only for buses. How many lawyers catch a bus to work? Not many. Because you're a lawyer, you may not catch a, catch a bus. I know many lawyers don't. They'll rather catch a taxi than to be seen in a bus because they're a lawyer and they're wearing a suit. It's a fact. But the same lawyers will catch a bus in downtown Sydney, catch the ferry, catch the train. The social culturalization. We need to change that. This is why about five years ago, we said anybody that brings, a, any bus company brings in a ready-made bus from overseas with you know, closed windows, etc. the duty is only 10%. Now it's 5%. If a small bus company, they don't pay any duty. You need to make buses attractive. I know many of you don't want to get on a bus in the morning wearing a suit where the tarpaulin is the window. You need a closed window. But it brings about enormous challenges too. If I'm living in Davu Levu inside, and I want to catch the dedicated bus on the dedicated bus lane, how will I get from my house to the main road? I may have a car. But where will I park my car? So we need to have parking stations. It may require land acquisition. If we're going to build, for example, light rail system, because there's been no planning done, we have to acquire a lot of land. FRA will have to engage in compulsory acquisition. Do you know the rights regarding compulsory acquisition? What are your clients' rights? Do you go to arbitration? Do you negotiate? Can you take government to court? All of these issues will actually come to the fore. You need to be aware of these uh, challenges within that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to also uh, make a comment about the environment. Of course, as you know, um, a lot has been said, and of course, the, I understand the chair of the Human Rights Commission also linked the right to environment, the right to life, right to housing and sanitation, 
and we've got food water, food and water, health. All of these are very important cases, or important rights. But the jurisprudence in Fiji regarding environment has not developed. Almost zero. There's very little jurisprudence in respect of socioeconomic rights in Fiji. Very little. I don't know how many lawyers, and there's one particular case I think to do with housing, SG, but I think it was knocked out quite early on in the piece because of technical flaws. But please, lawyers, understand that there are many avenues available for you now to be able to enforce socioeconomic rights through this plethora of rights that we have in the Constitution. The jurisprudence is lacking. Please think about it. Look at overseas uh, laws that have developed. India is a good example. South Africa is a good example. In numerous other Commonwealth countries where the rights in respect to socioeconomic rights has developed quite significantly. Um, the EIA, of course, the Environment Impact Assessment, uh, there's a number of issues pertaining to that. I understand the director spoke about that. And again, these are very, very important issues. But please remember that from government's perspective, when we enforce this, we actually not just think about ourselves, but the future generations. And it is actually a balancing act. Because you do want economic development, but at what cost? I was uh, last week on Thursday at the uh, IMF gathering in Nandi, uh, where they have assessed, the World Bank has said about the Pacific prospects. And one of the areas they talked about is a lot of prospects in gaining economic wealth in the Pacific through mining. I mean, a country like Fiji has got the largest number of tourist arrivals compared to all the other Pacific Island countries. What impact will mining have on our environment? Do we want mining from that perspective? Or do you want limited mining or mining that will actually ensure that we adhere to the environmental standards? But I, I think there's a lot of scope there for you as legal practitioners to understand uh, what is happening within the uh, environmental uh, space. Climate change has raised an issue, a number of legal issues. Tuvalu is going underwater. We've had three villages that have been moved to higher ground. Wuni Dongaloa is one of them. Now, what happens now? They, of course, had their own land. Now it's inundated with water. Does it become part of foreshore land? What happens to the rights of these people who now had, you know, the cultural practices and the rights in that particular land area, they no longer can access that? Is there any ability to enforce that in terms of accessibility? When we're going to move them up on a hill, they're not used to living on a hill. They spend the entire past 500 years living on the coastal line. So what are the issues that that actually affect them legally. Are you prepared to understand that? Do you know how to enforce that? If Tuvalu goes on the water, or parts of it, where will the territorial rights then be? The economic zone, 200 mile economic zone, is measured where you have your land ending, and then you go 200 miles and you come around. So if the island sinks here, and you've got two other islands behind that, does your EEZ be determined by the island that no longer is on top, but is underwater, or does you go back to the island that's actually on top? What happens to issues like climate refugees? What will be Fiji's position? Fiji said they'll take climate refugees from those three countries, Tuvalu, Kiribati, and FSM. What will be their status? Will you be able to have that particular level of uh, legal nous to be able to represent them? These are many issues that actually uh, stem from, uh, from that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, also again, last but not least, uh, one of the most sort of topical areas, which is the online uh, safety and talking about cyber bullying and trolling, etc. And I wanted to use some uh, examples, and I think there was a bit of misunderstanding on the Online Safety Act, which, as you know, comes into effect from the 1st of Jan. And let me read out to you, because I think it was not specifically read out, as to what is the objective of this particular act. It is to promote responsible online behavior and online safety. B, promote a safe online culture and environment that addresses cyber bullying, cyber stalking, internet trolling, exposure to offensive or harmful content, particularly in respect of children. Deter harm caused to individuals by electronic communications and provide an efficient means of redress for such individuals. And if you look at the redress provisions, there's ample opportunity here to be able to get the parties to actually communicate with each other. One classic example, of course, as we've seen, as was highlighted in the, in the talk, that sometimes two adults in a relationship may share images of each other, nude images. One of them has now decided to move on with their life, the other one has not. The one that has not decided to move on may start putting up those images. At that point in time, 
the images or the taking of those images were consensual. The putting up of those images now is no longer consensual. What will happen? Do I have the liberty to do that if I feel that my girlfriend has jilted me? I feel very aggrieved. She's just about to get married, get settled down in a nice relationship, in a respectful relationship. I can completely come and demolish the entire life of hers. Of hers. His new partner may not understand that. In fact, it was very interesting. When we actually had this bill passed by parliament, I had a lady calling me up from Banwalevu who said, when is this law coming into effect? Because the family dispute, family split. She said, they're putting nude pictures of my grandmother online. <laughs> because the families are now fighting with each other. She said, can we stop this? I said, well, you can't. The law is not there. She said, the police aren't doing anything about it. The police can't do anything about it. So there's a number of issues. As you know, the very uh, infamous case now, we had one young lady in Latoka where somebody put a camera in her room. And as you would in the privacy of your own room, you would change. You'd get undressed. You'd go and have a bath, shower. Everything was being picturized live. Live. And of course, then she was marketed online. These are the hardcore realities, and this is what this particular bill, ladies and gentlemen, has a huge focus on. Many of your grandparents or parents, potential parents, this focus is on children, actually. So we, we need to ensure that uh, uh, when you, when the law comes into effect from the 1st of January, you may actually be representing one of the parties. Please read this law. There are over half a million Facebook users in Fiji. As was highlighted by Saud, there are more SIM cards in operation in Fiji than the actual number of people. Some people, of course, carry one or two mobile phone numbers, some for legitimate reasons, some for illegitimate reasons. <laughs> but that's the reality in Fiji. Over half a million smartphones. Accessibility to information is actually um, quite liberal, very liberal, in fact. Some may argue too liberal. Some parents may argue that. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the reality is that your Facebook providers, they're not registered in Fiji. There's no way of regulating them. They don't even have an office in Fiji. That's the reality of social media. Some countries, of course, now in Europe, mandate that these companies be actually registered in their jurisdictions so they can regulate them. It is not an affront on free speech. It's, an aff it's actually trying to get some form of basic behavior that is uniform, and that protects the rights of other people too. Rights, as you know, is a, is a balancing act. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, of course, social media is almost instantaneous. As I used this example previously, you know, if I go now and post online and say, the brown frog ate the green horse, the reaction I would get, where did it happen? Were you there or were there others with you? How big was the frog? How big was the horse? But nobody questioned the fact that a frog cannot actually eat a horse. Have you marketed yourself? Please do so. Fiji is now becoming the hub of many of the international organizations. And as lawyers, you need to understand that and tap into that market. Enormous potential for mediation, enormous potential for arbitration. Please keep up with the times. And we have also, as policymakers, as lawmakers, have to keep up with the times as well as the judiciary. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank all of you for your attendance. Uh, it's been a, a great uh, conference. We look forward to your participation next year. I'd like to thank once again all the uh, speakers, uh, including the, the local speakers and also the international speakers. I'd like to thank all of you, in particular our Chief Justice, the Chief Registrar, the members of the judiciary who've uh, sat through the past two days. Please mingle around. We have an informal dinner uh, this evening. Please attend. It's all bulla. Uh, come to that. And uh, let's exchange views and ideas. Uh, because there's great fun in developing new ideas. Great fun in pushing the boundaries of the law. Great fun in developing new law. And ensuring that we all participate in the economic prosperity that we are on at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.